is the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Ricardo Oliveras is our guest today. Uh, 17 years with NASA doing different program management stuff. Um, also, this is our first episode ever with a hard stop. So I think it's going to be interesting to, <laughs> to see how that goes. Thanks cool. to me, right? <laughs> nah, it's, it's all good, man. You're a busy dude, and, and I respect that. Uh, I'm actually, I, I got something scheduled right after this. I think it'll work out good. That's good. That's cool. good. So it's I guess it's my fault. It's entirely your fault. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's a good thing. I'm happy. You know, it's uh, it works out nice. So yeah. I guess when we you and I first met, I, I kind of mentioned like you know you never see anybody that's like with the same company or group uh, or outfit for like 17 years anymore. Like that's that's old school. And and you kind of retorted that you know well it's not really like that because you've been doing different stuff you know at like different kind of departments, divisions, kind of what was that like and, and sort of what kept you at NASA so long? What got you in there in the first place? Yeah, so so one of the things, um, you know, what, one of my things is that, uh, and maybe hopefully this doesn't sound bad, right, but I get bored of doing the same thing over and over again, right? Yeah. Like it, it, it's, I, you know, I'm, you know, I have, you know, just like every human being, you know, I have, <laughs> I have patterns, right? And, and, you know, patterns do feel good. But when it comes to work, um, you know, I, I, I like to change around somewhat because, you know, it's a matter of wanting to learn different things, right? So, yeah. Um, so when I started out with, with uh, NASA, um, I started working with, with the team that um, they were actually doing wind studies of, on Mars. Oh, cool. With it. Yeah. So they they have this uh, small wind tunnel, uh, and, and it, within it they they have this bed of rocks, and they would lay down you know in front or behind the rocks they would lay down different objects. Um, actually, one of the first rovers that went to Mars went into that tunnel. Oh, cool! And that tunnel is actually within another chamber that gets pumped down to a Martian atmosphere. Uh, awesome. So I started working with that group, and, and it was a small group. It was a group of three people. Wow. Uh, and which then whittled down to like two people, including me. Nice. <laughs> so, so one and two guys. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I started with that group, and then it got to the point where, you know, there was electrical work to get to, to be done, uh, mechanical work, uh, data analysis, and it was like the geologists would look at me like, and you're on. And I was like, and I am not an electrical engineer, but <laughs> see what we can do. <laughs> That's awesome. Should have paid, paid attention to the electrical class. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but you know, the, 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 the cool thing was that um, because he didn't know any, any better or, you know, or, or we didn't, just didn't have anybody. It was just like, you, you know, you either get it done or, or it just, this experiment doesn't happen and, you know, it just, um, you know, would, would look bad on us and, you know, just, you know, it would feel bad too. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, just pulled out the books and started looking at them and at times just looking at them while I'm doing the stuff and it's trying to remember and trying to write it down. So that it was kind of a interesting experience. It was cool because, you know, it was, um, I was trying to apply the, the, the stuff that I learned in the book in real life, right? That's awesome. For a real experiment. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. That's definitely how I learned electrical, too. I mean, I was, I was just reading cover to cover, and I, I feel like I just, you know, it's like, all right, now make it work, you know? Like, all right. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so within that, that, um, that tunnel, um, you know, they would study how wind moved around these pebbles, um, and then eventually, you know, they, they put in the rover, which was, uh, I think it was Pathfinder. Yeah, happened. Yeah, that was um, one of the first ones. Just a, yeah, a smaller version of it, right? And um, they did some testing. It was at that point that, that I actually ended up leaving that that group, though. Um, but while I worked in there, you know, like I say, it was, it was I was doing everything. I mean, from the really cool electrical mechanical type of work down to the janitorial stuff, where it was just go in there and start blowing around. The, the wind tunnel, get the dust off of it. <laughs> Someone's got to do it, right? And I mean, especially when you're in those classified yeah. areas or like, you know, it's just a, a targeted, or not targeted, limited access. 
I've been in yeah, that position yeah. where like the engineers or the managers just have to clean the lab because nobody else is going to do it. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. So so you know that that was an interesting um, interesting work because it was working with with a geologist. You know, something that I didn't imagine I'd be doing. Right. Um, uh, and and so you know the dynamics were pretty you know pretty different than what a encounter nowadays right just because it's it's a him the geologist which he was really smart at what he you know in geology and, and, and the work that was going on um and then there was this engineer you know so it's like and that would have been there's you. always this friction yeah <laughs> right engineers and scientists yeah. i feel like have had that for the entire existence of science and technology oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that's definitely something that i've seen um throughout the years working with NASA is that, you know, at the beginning, I did not understand it. At the beginning, I thought it was just kind of a personal thing. But as the years went on, it, you know, I understood that it's, it's this friction that's between the engineer and, and the uh, scientist, um, which is a good friction, right? You know, it, it's, yeah. uh, but, but definitely something that's not a personal thing. It's just a, a different culture, right? For sure. Yeah the scientist and the engineer, right? Well, and the funny thing is, um, I mean, we talk a lot of crap on, on scientists as engineers, but I mean, they're entirely necessary. None of this would exist without oh, yeah. science. But without engineers, yeah. you know, the science would never see the light of day. So right. it's a symbiotic right. love-hate relationship. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you do get these scientists that are like, they're like engineers. Oh, for sure. And they don't get along with the other scientists. <laughs> so I, I could counter that. <laughs> and, they don't, and they don't quite get along with the engineers either, right? You know, it's like, they're like, he's lone wolves, you know? I haven't seen his um, mail. Maybe so. just because I don't work at like, like a, you know, as science of a heavy organization. So I, I haven't encountered that, that person yet. Mm. That, that sounds like kind of like a fun, fun kind of dynamic to, to try to be friends with. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, I've encountered a, a few of them, uh, and yeah, they're, they're just amazing people because they they know the science, and and while they are scientists, right, you know, biologists or so, they can tackle the engineering as well, and, and they can think in a very engineering um, way, right? Where it's awesome. Whereas you say, you know, you, you an engineer will take what, what the scientist has and, and actually make something out of it, right? Yeah. Um, where, you know, a, where the scientist will, event, you know, a lot of times hesitate because they want more data, uh, they want to perfect it, right? Yeah. Um, or they're on to the next thing. Or, like they want to, they want to look at something else far out. You know, you know, in, right. in more of like a what can we do in fifty years kind of way. Right. 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 Yeah. So, um, but but these, you know, some of these people that I've met that are, that are kind of. Um, it's a different breed, like, you know, they're engineers and scientists all in one. Uh, pretty amazing people. Have, have you met, with, so. just to kind of follow that tangent for a bit, have you met any MD, PhDs? Like, any, uh, say that again? People with like a medical doctor's degree, but also a PhD, like a doctor of philosophy. Um, no, no. They're an um, interesting breed. I'm starting to notice some patterns yeah. with a few of them I know. Oh yeah, so it's just dissimilar, <laughs> right? So like they don't fully get along with the doctors. They don't fully get along, and I say doctor as an MD, and they don't fully uh -huh. get along with like you know the. Um, they're actually the, the ones I know are all pretty well for the most part pretty personable. Some of them are kind of, yeah, it's like any group. I mean they're not all the same, but they are they're they're definitely badasses. I mean you know the the fact of the matter is you know like they they earned an MD and a PhD, so you know that's that's a crazy amount of intelligence and work, and yeah. um, so I feel like. Uh, they're definitely the most kind of like, kind of nerdy, experimental, interesting, like medical doctors I've ever met. And then right. like, conversely, like, you know, they're kind of like a little bit more practical than like your average researcher, or, like pragmatic, you know, because they've got that, right. you know, ability to operate on people if they want to, or, and some of them do. I mean, some of them see patients, but then they'll also do research. So right. it right. kind of, I, I imagine yeah. it must be kind of like that, like the breed. You, you know, you actually just reminded me, um, I didn't meet, well, I didn't really meet him, but I was in a project with one of those guys that, um, that was, you know, he, he, he was pretty amazing. So this guy, he, um, he was, so I guess, you know, jumping forward a few years, right? I guess I'll go back and forth just because the, you know, yeah, sure. the, the flow, sure. right? Um, so I did, I did meet this, this one guy. So he's, he's a doctor, um, 
and it was on this uh, medical project that I was on. That's um, awesome. You know, it, it's it's it was a, it was actually a program that we we were trying to develop sensors and hardware for uh, medical applications on the space station. Okay, way more um, awesome because now I know what it is. But I love medical <laughs> stuff, so I just get excited right away. Yeah, yeah. Was, it was for the space station, and then further on, right into going into deeper space. Um, and Very cool. this one guy that we had working with us, he was. I remember in one of the meetings we were discussing um, a a heart monitor, and uh, in about five ten minutes into the meeting, he says. Uh, by the way, guys, if you hear an ambulance, do not get worried because I'm okay. I'm actually at the hospital at the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I was thinking, you know, thinking to myself, like, aren't there people you should be taking care of right now instead of this meeting? <laughs> he said, he said uh, I'm expecting an ambulance in 20 minutes. Um, it's quite an emergency. So... You might just hear the ambulance and then cut out, and you won't hear me again until you know a day from now, right? Nice. <laughs> so, so that was the kind of guy, right? So he was. Yeah, he yeah, was, they're, they're badass. He was a doctor in the in the ER, and he's now helping us to develop this hardware to go on the space station or going to space in general, right? So, awesome. um, the, you know, again, I, I didn't personally meet him, but it was you know, he was on the project, you know. Um, it was, it was a, Those guys are all like know. that. I mean, like at least the ones I've talked to. Um, my aunt runs the stem cell lab at Yale, and um, uh -huh. she's like, she's casually talking about like working on like the COVID vaccines, like back in March of 2020. Like, it's like you know, <laughs> there's there's only you know, I was like mentioning all these ideas because we were trying to come up with ways to like help and decon and you know just the best effort from a pleb like me. And she was uh, like, you know, well, there's only a few biosafety level. She was BSL three labs in the world, so biosafety level three. And one of right. them is ours, you know, and so I was like, <laughs> all this stuff to do, and she made time to have this bogus call with me, you know, and I was just like, oh, wow. Yeah. Another one I yeah, talked no, to, so, or, uh, sorry, after you. No, no, so, so I was saying, yeah, you know, um, that's how this guy was, right, you know, it's just, you know. Don't don't worry if you hear the ambulance. <laughs> so, it's quite an emergency, like, that's so, you know, cool, too cool for school. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's probably bleeding out, yeah. you know, he's like, well, you know, it is what it is. I have to deal with it now. <laughs> right, right, yeah. You know, um, but that was an interesting team uh, because, um, you know, that one guy, you know, he's in the emergency room. And then we also had other teammates within the, the team that were, um, I mean, multiple PhDs on there, right? You know, uh, there's one guy, um, his name was Tony. Um, he had a PhD in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Holy crap. Yeah, and um, third one was software. How many years has this guy spent in school? And, <laughs> well, well, I'm not done. And, and <laughs> he was also a medical student. Holy um, crap. And, and, you know, if you, if you saw the guy out on the street, he didn't look, I mean, at that time, he didn't look much older than, like, 30. Wow. You know, um, later I found out he was older than that, um, you know, but Good for him. the knowledge that, Jealous. yeah, the knowledge he had was, <laughs> was just amazing. I mean, it just, it, it was, you know, I had lunch with him one time and it was just, you know, it was like, it was like the encyclopedia in front of me. I mean, just, <laughs> and, and he was just, you know, the other thing I've noticed is that um, a lot of these people are very hyper, right? They've got a lot of energy and it's just, if you're addicted um, to, to high degrees like that, I mean, yeah, I would imagine you need to have a ton of energy to be able to do that. Right, yeah. And, and this guy definitely was one of those. I mean, you spoke to him and, and you felt like, you know, like your typical conversation was at like, you know, a snail's pace and speaking with him, it was just like you had to elevate to like just, you know, faster than a cheetah kind of thing, right? Because the <laughs> way he thought, you know, how quick and it's like, you know, it's like you... It's like your head hurt afterwards. You're just like, oh my god, you're trying to keep up with that. <laughs> I think know? I do that to people sometimes. I'm trying to get better at it, but I'm I'm so quick to want to get to the next thing. I feel like uh, sometimes yeah. I just want to you know, chill out a little bit. But that's awesome. Yeah, man. yeah. No, um, you know. So at that time, he was talking about um, uh, implementing AI systems. Oh, interesting. To read, to read. Yeah, this this was a 
you know, some time back, um, AI systems into um, reading x-rays or just brain scans. Oh, that's been um, a thing for a while as far as I know. Yeah, that's that's a hot topic. Yeah, yeah, and, um, you know, heart scans as well. For diagnostic, um, I'm guessing. Diagnostics, yeah. At that, at that time, this was, I want to say this was maybe 10, maybe 10 years ago. But that's been it. that's been big since the '90s and '80s, even like late '80s. That, yeah. that topic started um, at some of the universities around here, like University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, were working on. Right. I think Digital Doctor might have been the name of the project, but there was there was one that was like really really early, and there've been iterations of that that have been going on pretty much as long yeah. as I've been alive. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and it was um, he was talking about that, and I remember this one guy that we brought in, and he was he was a, a you know, his job was to read x-rays, you know, and heart scans and so on. Nice. Um, and, and, I mean, like, this, this argument's, like, well, maybe it's kind of been put, you know, it's, it's put to, uh, to bed right now, but, or maybe not. But at that time, you know, it was a huge argument, argument because the guy was saying, like, there's no way the AI system can do that. <laughs> what, you're seeing is some, what you're seeing is just an issue that you're having with your software programming. It's just, it's not there. You know, and uh, you know well, now you know it's like it's just that the human couldn't catch it. You know, it's not the machine. <laughs> that's amazing. So, Do you know what the issue yeah. was in that case, or did is that? Um, it, it, they were just it was the the system was seeing just um, you know issues with the heart that would that would lead to eventually lead to you know some kind of a um, a heart attack or so on, right? Um, the patient had one, but. Yeah, you know, and, wow. and the patient eventually did have one, but at that time, the the guy that was you know he was he was boots on the ground pretty much, right? He was saying there's there is nothing there. This patient's fine. Like, you know, what are you worried about? There's a glitch. There is nothing there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> um, so you know, some of the people that I've worked with, right? Um, That's cool. But man. just kind of getting back to to the whole culture within NASA, you know, yeah. um, within the different teams, you know, it's, it's a different culture, right? So, so after working with the, with the geologist and I moved on to, um, working with, uh, a team that developed material for, uh, re-entry into, you know, planets, right? So, um, the space shuttle was one of them that we, we worked on materials that, that would protect it from overheating and, and getting burned up. Like those tiles on it? The tiles, yeah. Nice. It, so it was tiles, but then it was also other um, materials and other. So that was all the really, same team that developed like the the layers of stuff on this. I mean, I, I don't know this as intimately as you do, obviously, yeah. but yeah. So I know it so from the museum team, fanboy uh, perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so this team, uh, we you know, they they developed uh, the the tile system, right, um, or or the, the material. Um, but there were also other materials that were being tested that were just you know, really cool stuff that just, they weren't tiles. And, you know, um, so, it, so, so within that team, uh, the dynamics were very different. It was a much bigger team. Um, and, you know, you know, we had our electrical engineers, we had, we, we didn't really even have software engineers with, within that team. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but that team was very, um, very knowledgeable about, you know, materials and so on the one thing that i encountered was that the, the culture was very uh, uh clickish <laughs> uh, like like people <laughs> had their friends they won't talk to anybody else basically yeah yeah Interesting. You know, um and I, I was really really young at that time as well so you know i had a lot to learn too right and, and yeah. you know getting to uh work with teams and not wanting to go in there and say Hello, this is me, and we're gonna change things. You know, now that, now that we're here, right? <laughs> that's what everybody wants: is some kid right out of school being like, "This is how you should do your job." Person that's been here for yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, especially with this team, right? You know, so I'm coming yeah. in, and I'm like, I've got all this knowledge, and you know, let's implement this. And they're like, "Hold up, you know, yeah. you're gonna what? <laughs> Get out of here!" You know, so <laughs> exactly right. You know, so those were. Uh, very uh, turbulent five years that I worked with that team. Ah, uh, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, most of the people there were material scientists. 
um, in, in, uh, people that were had many years in experimental type of uh, testing. Um, but but that was a, a team that was you know like say this they, you know they had a, a family you know and, and they didn't they didn't let you in ah, or at least right. they didn't let me in let's say that, Sorry to hear that <laughs> they man. didn't let me in that easily you know. So was that was that just straight material science then, and like really not? So you, I mentioned the tiles, but it sounds like that team probably didn't even work on those. It was more just specifying and designing the material that was eventually made into tiles and, and other components. Of right. The so it was mostly the material that was uh, went into the tiles. Um, the uh, and then any other materials that we, you know, that other companies might come up with. You know, we would test them. Um, we would help them out with in terms of uh, scientific analysis. Uh, so. Um, we, we did quite a bit of things on there. Um, that was also the team that helped out in the return to flight. So after the shuttle, if you remember, the shuttle broke apart over Texas. Yeah, yeah, we call uh, When it was on re-entry. Um, so when that happened, they shut down all operations, right? And, and then um, we, or, or the team that I was on, um, performed all the testing to try and get, to get us back into flight mode. Um, awesome. <clears throat> Yeah, so those were, um, you know, it was it was a real sad moment when that happened, right? Because yeah. um, it it just, you know, just the loss of life, right? Uh, sure. In addition, uh, but but the interesting thing is when I saw that happen, because I had been working there with with that team, I immediately knew uh, exactly what was wrong, <sighs> because. Yeah, and um, you know, it's 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 one of those things where like we had seen all that during experiments, right? You see the you know one one example, right? The the uh, thermal couple. Yeah. Thermal couple starts reading and it starts reading high, 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 high. It goes really high, and then cuts out, and then all of a sudden starts reading another temperature, right? Um, which is what what was seen. Essentially, what happens is. Your thermocouple starts reading, it melts. Ah, oh, that explains it. It cools off and then joins again at a different point, right? And so now it's going to give you a reading, but it's giving you some bogus reading, right? Makes because sense. It, it, it's now been somewhat joined at some other point, and, and so it's it's off, right? Yeah, it's no longer um, the same thermocouple. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, right, right. So and that spike um, is probably a breach in in the material somewhere. I'm guessing. Right, right. Yeah, the breach happens. The thermal couple starts reading that, and then you know, it dies out, and then you know. So we had seen that in a lot of the experiments. <clears throat> um, the other thing um, was the the foam, right? So we we had not worked with foam, but in my college years, I actually worked with foam because uh, we were building a hovercraft. Oh, cool! Um, and yeah, and so give me one second. No problem. So. In college, I had been working with foams, different types of foams, because we were <clears throat> trying to uh, build a, a hovercraft. We, we eventually did, but the knowledge that I acquired about foams, about how soft and how hard they, they you know, they can be, um, you know, the, those two, it was interesting because seeing those th two things, it's like that foam is damaging the, the, um, the shuttle, right? Like it just, it was obvious to me, and, and I'm sure it was probably obvious to people that knew about foams. Yeah. Um, but in, in, you know, in hindsight, now we know, right? But um, but just those two pieces, you know, those two experiences um, led me to believe, that, you know, or or I knew exactly what had happened with the show, right? Like. Yeah. Um, and and then that was confirmed. Not to say that I'm. You know, a complete expert at it, but just those experiences well, if, help me. To when, when you're around a machine and, and you're involved in its development, I mean, this has been my experience as well. You get to know it. I mean, you're spending thousands of hours with it. And so you get to know, you know, the yeah. failure modes, the um, the nuances, the weird behaviors, kind of like the back of your hand. And so, I mean, that, that makes total sense to, to someone like right. me who's worked in R&D as long as I have. Right. Just not so, as long as um, you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, so that was the team with, with the, um, you know, testing the materials on there, and, and it was it was fun. You know, we we uh, burn things up for life. That, that was every day. I go in in the morning, and you know, what are we gonna burn up today? 
<laughs> when we're going to explode. <laughs> right? you know? Yeah. Because uh, everything was taken to Baylor there pretty much, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, except for the instruments. And when the instruments did were taken to Baylor, that, that was not fun because that was, that was my job to keep those going. Ah. And, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it just meant you didn't get to Everybody, sleep that night. <laughs> right, yeah, you know, everybody, you know, the other people were like, yeah, let's, let's, take, let's take the material to Baylor, let's see what happens to the instrument as well, and it's like, no, we don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one that's going to have to take care of the instruments. So you, you know, mentioned so. the thermocouple failure, that's why you knew what that looked like so well, was because of those experiments yeah. and, and just experiences, yeah, it sounds yeah. like intentionally and yeah. unintentionally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so those, yeah, those, um, those experiments taught me quite a bit about thermocouples, um, you know, and, and it was just a, a lot of fun just melting things and just, you know, um, but, but that team was the one that, you know, as I was mentioning, it was, it was a team that did a lot of experiments <clears throat> to get us back into flight. That's awesome. Uh, and the, you know, the interesting part of that was that, or the, the way a, a day went, right, during those times was the mechanics would come in about four in the morning and they would come in at four in the morning because they were preparing the, the facility to be able to cool down <laughs> the, uh, from those high temperatures that we were going to be testing that day. And these were extremely high temperatures to the point where uh, the facility, um, so, if, so the facility is essentially this, if you think about it, it's a, a jet engine being blown into this um, concrete bunker. Okay, if that you makes think sense. About it that one, right. Yeah. <clears throat> but in order for you to do that, you have to cool down the the the, uh, the, the gas that's coming in the, the plasma. Right. Yeah. You, you have to cool it down. I mean, it has to hit your model, but then you also have to be able to cool it down because you know it's it, that heat's got to go somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, and so the mechanics will come in at four in the morning and put a whole bunch of copper pipe around it. <laughs> and I mean, just tons of it. And we were going through a lot. Why, of why did you have to there. rewind the copper? Would the copper just straight melt? Like, what was what was the deal with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the copper would would. So so the other thing was the the water being pumped into the those copper pipes was not refrigerated. It was just tap water. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, it's probably um, coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm messing around. <laughs> Make you feel good, right? I don't think that's what it is. I'm just being, making a joke. I made my anxiety. <laughs> I've got so much anxiety. It's uh, it's not good. It does drive me, I think, in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, so they come in and, and so the, the water that was going through those pipes was just regular tap water. It was not cooled out. I mean, in fact, your, your tap water is probably colder than what we were getting there. Um, and so. Uh, the temperatures were so high, you know, 3,000, 4,000 degrees. Fahrenheit? So um, probably Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, it would just essentially just melt away the copper. And then um, because the, the other thing is because this chamber's in a vacuum, you know, you, <clears throat> you burst the, the pipe and then water would spray out and then just turn into this big old chunk of ice. <laughs> and so now you've got this huge chunk of ice in there in the chamber that now you have to wait for it to melt, you know. Um, and Do you uh, stop the experiment and just keep time. running it when, when, the, when the copper bursts? What's that? Do you stop the experiment when the copper bursts or did you just keep running? Um, it depended. So if, if, it was, if the burst was small enough that it was just spraying a little bit of ice or, or water and then creating ice, uh, yeah, I get it. we'd keep going, right? But uh, oftentimes that would only... You know, it, it only do that for a few, yeah. two, a few, two or three seconds, and, and then it precipitates pop. a much bigger failure. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's something that we wanted to avoid because that would, you know, ruin the model and then also, um, uh, you know, take up time, right? <coughs> Excuse me. It's just that's that's all good, man. Here. No worries. I, I had that earlier today. I've just been drinking a lot of water ever since. Yeah, water's not not helping out right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Got my uh, secret stash over here. The the water, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted to drink booze, I would just do it openly. I've been doing that on every other episode of this. But yeah. you know, I recorded uh, four of these this week, and I was drinking straight whiskey in all of them. 
And at a certain point, like, you just don't want to drink anymore. You know, it's just like this, this is too much. <laughs> but that's all you have left and you just keep going. <laughs> I'm just going to drink water. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I want right now. It's a really yeah, underrated yeah. beverage. I mean, there's, there's, you know, lobbies for like, you know, Budweiser and, you know, certain types of vodka and, and everything. Nobody advertises water because there's no money in it, but it's great. I yeah. It. At least not yet, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. When we start that, running out of it. The tank girl future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let's see. So where was that? Yeah. So, copper um, burst down the experiments, I think. Yeah. The experiment, the, the mechanics would come in really early, um, to, to make sure that the, the whole experiment stayed cool enough so that we can continue, uh, ex, you know, continue the experiment. And these experiments, they would, you know, these tests would be 30 minute tests, which is a long time for us in, in, in that facility. Um, you know, 30 minutes of 3,000 degrees is, <clears throat> it's, an eternity. You know, it's pretty hot. You know? Yeah, I agree. Um, and so, you know, they come in really early, experiments would go on all day, you know, most everyone would go home eight o'clock, nine o'clock or so. <clears throat> um, just, you know, mostly the scientists, right? Just uh, calculating and so on. but. It was pretty intense uh, days you know, d during that time, you know, to try and get the, the shuttle up and going again. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, it, it was like say it was sad. And but doing the experiments was pretty exciting, just because you're trying to prove things out, um, and you know you're you're having to really think and, and trying to develop right on the spot the experiment. Um, you know. Yeah. Just because. It, something new right so when i feel like when you're um, in kind of a tragic situation i mean that's sort of an opportunity like this is gonna sound maybe bad but it's kind of like an opportunity to shine i mean if you have a level head and you're able to think analytically and kind of keep your wits about you then you're a really right. valuable asset in that tragedy and, and maybe you can make a difference and so i don't know i don't think right. there's anything wrong with looking at it that way yeah no i mean it's it's true yeah i mean you know tragedies uh, or at moments are, could also be opportunities right you know, absolutely so. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot to, lot to learn in those moments of, you know, uh, and that, that's always in hindsight, right? At that moment, it's just, it's just, it's just horrible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> <You know? laughs> did you feel any kind of like, uh, and then tell me if this is too personal and, and obviously you have to answer mm -hmm. it. Did you feel any kind of guilt? Like if you sort of feel like you knew what the failure mode was like almost in advance when it, when it went wrong? Um, you know, I, I didn't feel guilt, but, um, I did have, um, kind of a, uh, I guess maybe it was guilt, but it was just, just this, this feeling of like, just like, I, I know what's happening. Like, I know what's going to happen, you know? Um, so it's like, it's, it's this feeling of like, you know, if you knew the future, right, you, you wouldn't want to know it in that, in, in that moment, it's rough. you, you know, I felt like I knew the future. Like when I saw those thermal couples, you know, um, you know, and, and what they were saying, right on, on, on their, uh, what was happening, it, it's like, they're not going to make it like, yeah. you know, uh, and I'm sure a lot of other, uh, engineers, you know, knew that or, or felt that as well. Right. You know, but it was just, it's one of those things where like, <clears throat> at that moment, you, I, I did wish that I hadn't known any of that, like, just, you know, because it didn't, it felt, um, you know, there was, it just felt like there was no recovery from it, right? It's right. Was, yeah, like a helplessness, was, you know, where you, you, yeah, you know it's going right. to fail, but you can't do anything about it. Right, yeah, yeah. you know, um, yeah, the only thing I could think of in that moment as well was just thinking, well, you know, I, I don't have a intimate knowledge of the shuttle, so... Just maybe, you know. Maybe, maybe there's a subsystem I don't know okay. about. Maybe there's something that'll that'll fix it and save them. Right, right. Yeah, yeah but uh, yeah, that's the yeah that, that's the that's the hard part of those moments, right? So, that's rough. And then and then uh, just um, you know, back then I didn't really work with the astronauts at all. <clears throat> you know, once in a while we'd have an astronaut come to the facility and look around. They'd give them a tour, but. Um, that's something that, that at that moment I, I didn't. So I think that if I hadn't been working with them, that would have been even bigger than that, right? You know, I'd imagine. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 
um, which is something that I do now, right? I work more with the astronauts now, um, or at least I, I, you know, I know I'm a little bit better than than at that time, right? Um, yeah. Not that I, not that I need every single one of them, you know, um, but. If you know the end user of something you're working on, you can make a better thing. So I'd imagine. Right. 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 The biological experiments you're doing these days are probably much nicer as a result of talking to the astronauts that are running the experiments. Right. So, yeah. So in the current work um, that I do, um, we are doing biological experiments. And what we do is we we train the astronauts to perform these experiments. Um, and, And then once these experiments get launched, uh, then at that point, you know, we get the opportunity to speak with the astronaut to uh, help them out throughout the, the, the experiment, right? Um, so we do get to know them quite a bit more. Uh, we know their names and who's going to be up there. Um, we know which astronaut is good at a particular <laughs> skill, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, so we know them a little bit more. It's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more intimate, right? Um, yeah. You know, um, and again, I don't, I don't need all of them, but. At least I get to see them. I, I get, get to know their name and understand what their skills are and so on. So, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a little bit more more intimate with this uh, job that I now have. That's um, cool. And and speaking about this job, so so what we do is we perform biological experiments on on space station. Um, the thing about performing those experiments is that you know they happen at during our night, right? Um, and so, you know, oftentimes we'll be performing, they'll be performing these experiments and we'll be supporting them and, you know, 12 o'clock rolls around and it's like, <laughs> like midnight, pull out my sandwich, not my sandwich, their sandwich, they pull out their sandwich kind yeah. of thing, right? <laughs> Start having lunch, you know, <laughs> and they're like, well, we're going to take you know, a 30 minute break or a, an hour, what, what have you. Yep. Um, they're they're going to have their lunch and it's like. It's midnight over here, you know, it's one o'clock over here. <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, you know, I don't get that with the ISS, but I mean, I work with people in India, you know, or you know, other parts of the world. And I mean, I don't know, those, those means are kind of stressful for that reason. Because I mean, you know, you get up at four in the morning or you're going to bed at, you know, two or three in the morning just to, to make yeah. the timing work, you know, and it's... Uh, I don't know, I've yeah. kind of learned to embrace it a little bit, you know, because it's like, well, you have to stay up those weird hours anyway, so you may as well kind of enjoy it a bit. It's a special right. kind of masochism, I think, you know, you just, like, yeah. oh, let's do it. I think the military guys call it embrace the suck. So, yeah. you, you know it's going <laughs> to suck, so you just lean into it. It's like, uh, what's this guy's name, uh, Gogans, I think it's his last name. Uh, this one, I think he's... He said he was he was in the military. I don't, I don't think he is anymore. But he now, um, um, yeah, he does all this crazy stuff, and it's just like one of his um, models. I think is is basically just embrace the suck, right? Just you know, learn to love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's a kind of stoicism, you know. Like it's a, it's a beautiful thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, you know. So, um, you know. I, so, you know, going back, you know, just stepping back a little bit in this position that I have, right, is um, I'll, I'll kind of take you through the timeline of this experiment, right? So, <clears throat> you know, we work with the uh, scientists, right, to develop these experiments. Um, you know, these are experiments that are developed uh, with scientists both within NASA and then also from academia and so on. Cool. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, my team, you know, we develop the sensors or hardware, whatever they need to develop, you know, to, to make these experiments happen, um, both here on the ground and then also in space, right? Because uh, while you want to have the same hardware, sometimes it, it's got to be a little bit different just because gravity, no gravity, right? So, you know. Um, Makes sense. Slightly different. Are there any other factors um, besides gravity that impact, you know, having to specify different components for those uh, environments? Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You specify different components. Is it, um, is it just gravity though, or is there anything else that's like a different variable that's confounding there? Well, so so you've got radiation. Okay. You know, um, so you, you've got a lot of factors on there uh, that that you have to take into account. Um, you know, safety for the astronauts. That, that's Makes also a big one, right? Yeah, so, it's critical on many something, people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, things that we can use on here, um, 
become kind of deadly up in space. So, you know, um, anything that is remotely sharp down here, I'm just looking at my laptop here, it's got like a sharp corner, that that would be a definite, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah exactly. <laughs> so anything that's remotely sharp, right, um, is a complete no-no up there, right? Because, it, you know, if one of the astronauts gets cut and, it, and it's your hardware that he or she got cut on, you've got a lot of explanation to do in your whole yeah. team, right? And it's yeah. just, you know. Um, Even for just a paper so, cut or like something that would appear minor normally. Um, yeah. Is that is in that space, just because of the, the ability to deal with it is, is reduced or is it because the danger is greater in space or both? Well, so it's, it's both, um, you know, so you've got, um, so it turns out that viruses and bacteria are apparently a lot more virulent uh, in space. Yeah. Uh, and then also, you know, the immune system of the astronaut is actually compromised up in space, right? So what sense. normally would be okay for you down here is might not be okay for you up there, right? That makes a lot so, of sense. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, you want to get cut plus, you know, Last thing you want is these little drops of blood just floating around, right? <laughs> Grossing out the other be... astronauts. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and so, so we developed the hardware, uh, and, and then the, the hardware actually goes through different phases of, of, of development and experiment. And so, sure. With each, it, it's it's almost like um, you know. Um, it's almost like using the agile method in a very, very slow process. <laughs> yeah. um, We've talked about this off, off the show that. for the listeners out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because what, what happens is we, you know, we develop, you know, the hardware and as one, ex, you know, from one experiment to the other, you know, we, we add components or, you know, features to it. Right. Which is you know, you know, pretty typical of, of working agile, right? Like you know, in software, right? Yeah. Um, it's a bit, you know, you know, um, in, in the past it, that's been done a whole lot slower. Um, with my team, we 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 push the envelope and, and develop it a little bit quicker. Um, we make the scientists very uncomfortable though. <laughs> <laughs> Is it scientists though or like bureaucrats? Cause I feel like that would be like, like directors or like just people that had been there like a, a really long time from the old days that are used to like everything waterfall would, would be the ones that would take exception more than, cause I feel like scientists are like, have a, have a higher risk profile than engineers in my experience, but I'm probably not really? seeing it. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Right? Like, so I, I don't know. Yeah, because because my experience there working um, with you know all types of scientists is that they, their risk threshold is is just I mean it's it's like this it's like interesting you know do you even want to do you even want to go outside of the street <laughs> yeah you know, because I think I need to um, hang out with more scientists because I'm around so many engineers I might just be having this false conception now. <laughs> Yeah, because the, the scientists I've worked with, they, they, they're very risk adverse, um, and 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 so, you know, with my team, right, you know, and, and, you know, they, they they get a little uncomfortable because we'll push it, you know, um, at a higher, you know, we'll, we'll operate at a higher, a more riskier level, right? Yeah. Um, because and, that's how you move uh, faster, is what I would think, right? I mean, correct, right? Yeah, you're right. not just taking risks for the you sake of doing it. You're you're trying to make progress. Yeah, and, and part of it, uh, is in particularly in this experiment, is that we've been given a very short time. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're having to develop sensors and instruments to go up in space. Uh, one one is the COTS and the other one is the, you know, commercial off the shelf. Grown instrument, right, right yes. commercial off the shelf, right? <clears throat> um, and, you know, the, the turnaround time that we have is, is pretty short. Um, and so, you know, the, if, if we take the less risky approach, it, it's like, it's not going to happen. Right? Yeah, that it's makes just, perfect sense. I mean, and I feel like I've, I've been in that situation too, where I've been running a team or on a team where, where somebody's 
tried to give us a deadline or, or given us a deadline rather that's just it's very close and then they've tried to also enforce a set of procedures where if we were right. to follow that set of procedures it would be impossible to meet that deadline and right you have right. to negotiate expectations in those situations right. or break a right. rule or i mean there's a bunch of ways to to make it happen but you know i think it just yeah. depends you know on the situation so it's, it's yeah the, the one thing that i do is i i try and keep our safety person with us very close and, and you know involve that person in all the meetings um, because you know i want to go fast and i want to get this developed quickly uh yet i don't want to um uh, get us in trouble and in, in, yeah and then we shortcut the, the safety aspect right yeah. because the the safety aspect um is huge you know and, yeah and of course just like i explained right you, you heard an astronaut that's it like just end of story like it doesn't matter how quick you came in it was just that, that's the end right yeah that makes um, sense does the safety plus, person plus all, oh sorry after you plus all the work that is now involved in trying to resolve that issue right so yeah. um you know the, that that's why I, I keep that safety person close you know uh, updated pretty much on a daily is basis. That, is that like an OSHA official or like like occupational health and safety or some like an no, engineer? No, no, no. This, this is, uh, so when I say safety, it's <clears throat> it's a NASA safety uh, personnel. Uh, their duty is is to basically, well, and they have multiple duties, but one of the things is, is make sure that the hardware that we're sending up there um, uh, is meets the requirements, uh, both, you know, the, the requirements, you know, engineering requirements, but then also safety requirements that are needed to go up into the space station and, and perform an experiment and have astronauts touch it and so on. So what are some so, things that that person's helped out with? Uh, where, you know, it's, it's something that you so, might not have seen, but they, they kind of caught it and it was good for the mission. Um, so something that I've missed. Um, so Well, just something that they thing, caught that anybody would have missed, except like somebody that's just looking for what they're looking for, I guess is more what I'm... Oh, um, it's... Uh, I'm trying to think here just because I've, I've got so many years working on something that, you know, just working with them so many years that uh, I, I kind of think of the stuff that they think of. Um, nice. But what, what they end up becoming, um, you know, is the, a second pair of eyes as well, right? That's, so, that's necessary, I think. I mean, even seasoned people, you know, on like a short night of sleep or something yeah, can, can miss things. Yeah. I, I remember I was at one organization where, um, the safety kind of went awry. So this is maybe why I've got like a weird kind of, you know, feeling. Uh, I had a boss that cut off his thumb uh, in a machine tool accident. I won't bore you with the details right now because we only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> but um, I, I had a boss that, that amputated a thumb. And, and as a result of that, um, we had some silly safety procedures that weren't really grounded in reality. So we had to wear cut-proof gloves. We were working with scissors in the office, like around like sharp paper, like to not get a paper cut. Like you had, you had <laughs> like electrical dikes for like cutting cable. You would have to wear gloves when you were using them, thereby making you less dexterous with the tool, you know, and slowing right. down, you know, your job. Um, and I don't know, you know, it was, that's why I brought up occupational health and safety because that was the organization that was responsible for sort of enforcing these kind of over the top, in my opinion, procedures. Right. So it's, it's good yeah. to hear that, you know, you've got safety people that are, are kind of contributing something and it's not just yeah. frivolous, you know, like over caution to the point where it doesn't make sense, but it's, yeah. it's actually keeping people safe. Well, you know, there, there have been, um, cases where, um, we've developed what we think are safety features, right? And it turns out that these safety features, actually create a, a hazard right <laughs> so uh, so that's that's one moment where the, the safety people uh, or, or you know engineers yeah catch this you know and they say well great you're trying to be safe but now you've actually created this safety issue right that's so awesome. that that's definitely something that they catch right you know that typically you know we as just engineers aren't, aren't always thinking about yeah right? um, well, especially if it's not your primary they, focus where, whereas it is yeah theirs. right right um although they do teach us to kind of think about those things um, a whole lot more right um so so that's you know that's kind of the way i do it um you know and it's it's, it's worked out pretty well um nice we've been able to push things and, and move fast <coughs> excuse me um while still being being safe, right? And 
um, you know, our experiment won't be going up until next year, just COVID and, and a whole bunch of other it issues. Slowed down everyone and everything. Yeah, yeah, um, have kind of slowed us down quite a bit. So maybe uh, vaccine development. Right, right. <laughs> so, so once we develop this hardware, right, and it goes through all this testing, uh, ground testing, then at that point, then we package it up and send it off to uh, Kennedy. Nice. Um, and then, and from the minute that you start packaging all this up, you know, a lot of the time you got to take everything. So it's a matter of making sure you don't forget anything while you're at Kennedy, right? Um, <laughs> you can purchase things over there, right? It's not like you're going to the, the moon or Mars, right? But, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, there's certain uh, hardware that's critical that, that you don't want to forget, right? So, uh, but once we, we arrive over there, we then get to prepare the experiment for the launch. Um, and that, depending on the experiment, can be pretty, pretty stressful. Um, um, you know, in terms of uh, the amount of work and then also the hours that, that we end up working, right? So, you know, we, <clears throat> you know, depending on the experiment, we can be working 10 hour days, you know, 13, 14 hour days in, in, in some moments. Um, you know, sometimes it's short, right? But, but, you know, and then we come in at odd hours as well. Yeah. Um, because depending when the, the rocket will be launching, if it's in the midnight hours or you know, during the day. Um, but it's a very stressful moment. Uh, we've had moments where hardware fails at the last minute. Uh, so essentially, once you're preparing it, then they say at this time, uh, the group of or the team that carries the, the hardware over to the rocket <clears throat> will be stopping by. They will pick it up and take it over there. You have to be ready when that team comes by because the rocket is got has a timeline when it can launch and, and if you're not there, like the experiment's you not really fly. screw things up. Well, it's it's not only that you just don't show up; it's just that you know, just like an airplane, right? You got to take into account the, the mass that you have within the system, right? Oh <laughs> no, no. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Um, so you have to be there. Like you yeah. cannot be late and you, you cannot be not there, right? So um, it's amazing that yeah. even with like a year of, of advanced notice, that still can become an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I yeah, believe so, it. But, yeah, so preparing yeah. the experiment and, and at that point, you know, this last mission that we had, uh, about five minutes into it, we had hardware failure. And that was, it was, it was just, if we didn't fix it, we, we, you know, we weren't going to fly, like, it was just, um, we had to figure something out, so, um, the whole team just jumped on it, um, and it was, uh, you know, at the last minute, probably about, I'm not kidding you, probably within 40 seconds <laughs> that, that, that we got it fixed, um, you know, and it was, believe it or not, it was, it, it was a pin that was bent, Oh, seriously? Right. Uh, but you're not going to find that anywhere else, was, though. If you don't have that order, those things are pretty unique. That's yeah, rough. Everything was going well, and that pin just, you know, it just, it, it got bent. And then we had two people try and fix it, and they couldn't see it because it was a small pin. And, and you have to keep this sterile as well. That's the other thing. Right? Oh, oh, geez. So you're, yeah, so you're in a hood, you know, a sterile hood. <clears throat> and you're trying to manipulate this and you're trying to fix that pin and so on. Um, so we had three people try it. Um, and I jumped on that the last, the last one. I was like, nobody's <laughs> you were number fixed four. it, you know? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so I jumped in there. I was able to, you know, bring it back in, in line and we plugged it in and it was awesome. working. It was like, don't touch it. <laughs> they are here. <laughs> you know? But that moment was just extremely stressful and just, uh, you know, um, you know, so they took it away. It was off, went on to the rocket. Um, we had a team that also follows the, the payload um, out to the rocket and they perform the checks uh, out there because essentially we need to unpower it, right, from our system. And then it's got to be powered back up on the uh, Dragon or, or the, whichever rocket we're flying. Yeah. And then at that point, you got to perform certain checks to make sure that, 
everything's still moving along, right? Yeah. Um, and so it sounds fun to go out there to the rocket, but it really isn't. <laughs> 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 Imagine you're you're in Florida. It's it, you know it could be summer or winter, but in our case it was summer. Yeah. Uh, you're sitting in a van for hours, uh, you know, with a bunch of other people, um, and you're just sitting there waiting for you, you know, for your turn to load that uh, experiment onto the uh, rocket, right? Um, and so I think the guy spent something like four or five hours in the van. Like, you know, that's, that's not a fun thing to do. <laughs> How many people are you there with in a van? Uh, just out of curiosity. Like, are you fully, is it you and another person? Is it you and three other people? It, it could be, you know, probably three or four other people. Wow, okay. There's multiple experiments going out there, right? So, so it's tense. This is close quarters. You guys are yeah. there to do a job, but you're in close proximity. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, you, you just got to see it through. You know, there's, there's, no, yeah. there's no other way around um, it. But you're, you're in limbo because right. you're waiting. Right, right. So they're, they're waiting out there. And I, I think at one point they, they got off and went into a building and had some snacks. But nonetheless, you know, waiting out there, it's just not... Not, not a fun thing. So once it gets loaded on there, then, you know, now we, that's when, when you, uh, you know, we, we're a little relaxed because it's off our hands. It's in the rocket. Now we wait for the launch, right? Um, yeah. And then at that point, that's when we just go out there and, and watch the launch. Um, nice. And it's, it's one of those feelings that I was not expecting the, the feeling that I got when I saw this thing launch, right? You know, because you build something and it's like, great, oh, cool, you know, I built this, I helped to build this, right? And it feels good. But um, just, you're out there and you're seeing this thing and it's going to get launched to the space station. It's just this, <laughs> this feeling that it's like, wow, like, just, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> because the whole time you're working and you don't see it as an amazing thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's Good not job. until that moment happens, you know? Yeah. So um, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had so it's, it's a unique experience. That's awesome. I was just gonna say I feel like that what you said about you don't know how you're gonna feel. I, I can relate to that a lot. I feel like um, on project completions, like there there've been a lot of different emotions depending on the project, and it's been it's even been like I've I've done some things where I felt like it was really accomplished, and and you know you did something that was incredible. You never did anything like it before. And it worked, uh, and everyone's happy, and then you just feel empty inside because you want to keep working on it, and you don't get right, to because right. you delivered it. <laughs> so, it's like, yeah. it's like, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. My purpose is gone. Was, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was my life for like you know eighteen months or twelve months or something. <laughs> yeah, but it's good that you. It's good that it felt good to launch that one though. Like I'm glad you. I'm glad you got that kind of that payout at the end. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a really good feeling, you know. Once that it, it gets uh, launched, and you know you're, at, you know, and then once you see it up there and they're performing the experiments, and you know, you're starting to get results, it's like, you know, it's a really cool cool feeling, especially for an engineer, right? Where yeah, well, well, speaking as an engineer, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure the scientists will be like, really, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, as an engineer, it's just fun because you're putting hardware up there that's. You know, you just can't, for the most part, you can't uh, mimic the environment that they encounter, you know. Oh, so you get to see a whole new set of uh, parameters that's operating under. And then right. It's, it's almost like a next phase. Right. It's the biggest. Right. Microgravity? So, um, what's that? Microgravity, you said? M yeah, microgravity, yeah. So, uh, you know, on station, they still have a little bit of gravity, but it's, 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 it's in the, you know, it's very oh, small. Oh, I see. Like, okay, you know, got it, got it. Um, yeah, just having the hardware operate here on the ground, and, and you have to kind of think, if I'm in microgravity, I think this thing would do this, you know, and so you have, you have to kind of imagine, you have a big imagination when you're Nice, there. but then it actually right. works the way you thought it would, you know, and it's like, holy crap, right. I can't believe it. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my awesome. imagination still works. <laughs> <laughs> still got it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, I think I don't want to. I don't want to kind of keep you too long. I know you wanted to head out at the uh, the top of the hour. So, this has been really fun. I'd like to do this again if you're up for it sometime. I feel like we've got so sure. many stories we could talk about. I want to hear about the hovercraft sure. you made in school at some point. I didn't even know oh, about yeah. that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I don't know. This, this has been really good. Thank you for coming on, man. Uh, no problem. Thank Ricard you for Ricard having me. Is there anything you want to plug? Any projects you're working on? You want to tell people about? Uh, just 
Uh, not not at this point. Um, you know, um, I, I've got a lot of stuff that's going on, but um, yeah, not, nothing that I can advertise. Right? <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Man. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, so, great having you. Always a pleasure. Um, and have a great rest right. of your day. Okay. Thank you. Cheers, Ricardo. Hey, bye.